We're going to be in Psalm 17, I think. It says it's a prayer of David. And that's one of the five psalms that are labeled as a prayer. And it deals with the uh, first part of it deals with three things. Um, vindication, protection, and salvation. And vindication is clearing someone of blame or suspicion. And verses 1 through 5 deals with that. So let's read it. It says, Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer. That goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me, and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept, have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Well, he's telling the Lord, he says, and examine me here. And you'll see that I've done best I can to what you'd have me to do and but he doesn't say it's because of him uh, he's, you know he says I've kept thy paths concerning the works of men by the words of thy lips have I kept, have kept me from the paths of the destroyer hold up my goings and thy paths that my footsteps slip not so he's giving credit to the Lord for this um And it goes on. It's verses 6 through 12. He's praying for God's protection. It says, I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that saveth by the right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who can pass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now com uh, compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth. Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in the secret places. If you'll go back to verse 8. It says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Well, the apple of the eye, according to the, uh, what I can find, is the pupil of the eye. And if you look at somebody, when you speak to them, look them in the eye, you can see yourself. If you've ever paid any attention, there's a lot of people you have a conversation with, they can't look you in the eye. You know, but when you're having a conversation with somebody and look them in the eye, um, you can see yourself. Uh, but the Hebrew in it means little man of the eye. So it's basically the same thing. When you look somebody in the eye, you're seeing yourself. I thought that was pretty interesting the way that's worded. Uh, and verse 10 says, The fat of the heart, they are enclosed in their own fat, with their mouth they speak loudly. And that references fat of the heart. That means a calloused heart by disobedience to God. Or the laws around you, or whatever. Um, and very insensitive to others. Well, I hate to say it, but sometimes I can be insensitive to others too. But, you know, <laughs> it's not from disobedience. Um, fat of the heart. In verses 13, well, let's uh, go back to 12. It says, Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. You know, you've got to figure here, David ran from Saul for uh, 10 years 
They, uh, Saul cast a spear at him twice, sent men to kill him at least four times that I know of. Ten years he ran. If, we are, if we're in a bind for ten hours, we start whining and crying and carrying on. Ten years David stayed faithful. Ten years. Um, verses 13 through 15 deals with salvation. It says, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. Hmm. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to babes. As for me, I will behold thy faith in righteous, face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Interesting. Um, Verses 13 and 14 there says, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. So God uses men to do his will. He uses men, he uses nature. We can read that through the Bible. Um, he's going to use a man of sin at the end of time to deceive a whole lot of people. It's coming. Um, but if you go into 14, it says, From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. You know, these men that God uses only have satisfaction in this life. And it tells us here in 14 that they'll leave all their wealth to their children. Um... I had a, uh, several years ago, I had a guy, he was real concerned. He looked around him seeing um, people that he knew weren't doing the right thing, but they were prospering, and it bothered him. I said, hey, this might be the only joy they ever know in forever. This is the only joy. Our joy is on the other side, you know, it, it don't. Don't look at people that are not doing right and not prospering. And if they are prospering, hey, it ain't up to me. But don't worry about it. God's got it. But if you go to 15, it says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. David's talking about the afterlife here. Um... He knows that there's a better thing awaiting him. He's going to wake up with the Lord's likeness. Which is, I find, David had to be an enlightened individual. You know, and there's several through the Bible that we read about. Moses, Joshua, Joseph, David. I mean, these people had more of an insight as to what was going on than um, most that we read about. Yeah, ready for the afterlife. Before we go to Psalm 18, has anybody got any questions or comments? All right, there's not a whole lot of commentary to do on Psalm 18. It speaks for itself. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him, from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Ten years this song's been in the making. And it says, and he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Hmm. This love thee is pretty interesting. Uh, we would pronounce it Rawham, but it's R-A-H-A-M in the Hebrew, and it says to love deeply or have a tender affection. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I mean, God's just delivered him out of a, a train wreck, so I'm sure at this point in David's life, that was the number one thing on his mind was his love of the Lord. We read, read, read later on in David's life that he messed up just like we all have. 
It says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. That's saying a mouthful right there. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. That word distress here in verse 6 it means to be put into a tight place or cornered. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. So in my tight spot, in my corner, and cried unto my God, he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. And you got to figure... David was anointed king. God wanted him anointed king, but Saul was in the way. We won't go through all that, but um, there went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherubim and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he sent from above. He took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. So in verse 19, we're going from verse 6, we're in distress, we're in a tight spot, we're in a corner. But by verse 19, he's brought him forth into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I don't know, you know, I think of a boy that works for me he can, he can get in places and work on something that I can't even turn around in. I said, if you want me to help, you're going to have to move some stuff so I can get in here. And I think about tight spots, you know. And when I got out of high school, I did heating and air work. And there were some houses we got in, you'd have to take a little foxhole shovel and dig your way back under that house because there was no room under the house. You had to dig your way everywhere you went. And that's a tight spot. You know, and ain't nowhere to run. You come across a snake or a spider or something, you're, it's a fight because there ain't nowhere to go. Man, I'm sure there's uh, been some people that have experienced that, but yeah, you get in a tight spot like that, it makes you think about the tight spots of life. And usually when I get in a tight spot in life, eh, the good Lord's who I call on. You know, if I got any sense, that's who I call on first. But sometimes it's not, because I don't have any sense. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him and kept myself from mine iniquity. 
Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight, with the merciful. And he's telling, you know, depending on how we are, is depending on how we're treated. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For that will save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. God does not like arrogance. For that will light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leapt, leaped over a wall. As for God, and that word uh, run through a troop also can mean broken, broken a troop. Um, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth me upon high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken. By mine arms. Thou hast given, also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. <laughs> yeah, boy. I have pursued mine enemies, I have overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them. Even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of the heathen, a people whom I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me, and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies, yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man, therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. And that verse 50, great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. David is calling himself by his name like a child. You ever pay attention to a little one? You know, Will you give Keith a sucker? You know, me asking for a sucker, but I'm referring to myself. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to that, but, you know, children will sometimes do this um, when they're asking for something for themselves. And that's the way I take David here. You know, he's, he's asking the Lord, Great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. He's asking God for this. I think that's pretty well, that's pretty neat how it's written. Um, I don't know if I wrote this down or not, but um, we're going to talk about it a second. Huh, I don't know what I did with it. Oh, well, we'll, uh, we'll still take it. Go back to verse 36. It says, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. David was in training. David was in training for 10 years running from Saul. Um, God was training him for his service. He 
you think about it, Joseph trained about 13 years while he was captive in Egypt. Um, it took Joshua 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to be prepared for what God would have him to do. And Moses, when he confronted Pharaoh, was 80 years old. So if you haven't hit 80 yet, you haven't escaped the service. <laughs> You could still be called upon. You might be in training. I just, you know, that's just interesting how God uses the circumstances of your life to set you up for a position that he might have for you. You know, you just don't know. I mean, I'm sure that when Jimmy was making all them programs for the Eastman, them training programs, he was like, Lord, have mercy, what a... <laughs> You know, don't make any sense. It puts you in spots. Uh, but the good Lord is uh, setting you up so that uh, you might be of service to him. Psalm 19. Has anybody got anything before we hit Psalm 19? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sure he had doubts at times, bound to in 10 years, you know. But Brother Fred's saying that, uh, you know, as you read this, David had great confidence in God that he would deliver on what he promised him. He made him king, but it took him 10 years to get there, you know. Um, but, you know, you read through here, uh, David had a very special relationship with his God. Um, very special. And we, each one of us can have the same relationship with Jesus. If, it depends on how much time we want to put into it. Um, you know, the, the things of the world distract you. I mean, work, you got to work because I like to eat. But Paul says if you don't work, you don't eat. So I like to, I like to eat. But... It depends on what you invest into it because whatever you invest in, he's going to invest right back. So each one of us can have that same relationship, you know. So, and we know there, there's times when you uh, bow your head in prayer that you know you might not be getting in contact like you could at one time in your life. You might have to get a hold of somebody, get a little help. But, you know, we're just people. So we do the best we can do. Anybody else? Verse 19, this is a very interesting chapter, very interesting. Um, we'll take our time a little bit here because we'll read through it and then we'll go back. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language which their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, covering the converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. 
The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from a secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from, from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So if we go over here to verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There's a biologist, his name's Edward O. Wilson, and I pulled out some facts from him, and this is just a few. It says there's 1.6 million species of fungi, 10,000 species of ants, 300,000 species of flowering plants, somewhere around 4,500 species of mammals, uh, 10,000 species of birds. Man, that's just amazing. I mean, God decided that he wanted 300,000 different flowering plants, you know. Uh, but these numbers, and the list goes on, but these numbers pale, pale in comparison to the heavens. You ever been out, if you can go somewhere where there's no light pollution and look up, it is amazing. Um, amazing. It says there's believed to be at least 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe. We live in the Milky Way. That's one galaxy. 100 billion. Typical galaxies have from 10 million to 1 trillion stars all orbiting a center of gravity. The Milky Way that we live in, they estimate, has 400 billion stars. Most galaxies are several thousand to several hundred thousand light years in diameter. So if you was to go straight through that galaxy, it would uh, take several thousand to several hundred thousand light years. So let's talk about a light year. The speed of light is 186,282 miles per hour in a vacuum, so no wind resistance. I did a little math, um, and if it's right, that's 11,176,920,000 miles per minute. And it's 670,615,200 miles per hour per hour. So in an hour you can travel 670 billion miles at the speed of light. And it's <laughs> and most galaxies are separated from one another by at least a million light years. I mean that's vast. I mean you can't even get your mind around that. And Psalm 147 and 4 tells us God knows them all by name. Every star that's there, he knows. Think about that. I can't remember what I have for supper sometimes. What's that? <laughs> I mean, that just, that's just mind-blowing. And God knows them all. He knows every hair on your head or like that up. I'm going to get into something a little bit here, and we're not going to dig real deep. It's called the Hebrew Mazaroth, or Matzaroth. And all a Matzaroth is, it talks about the constellations. And if you study the constellations from the Hebrew perspective, I'm not saying this mess that we got now, but from the Hebrew perspective, it tells the plan of God's redemption through the stars. Um, you know, God... The book speaks of creation, you know, Genesis 1 and 2, and there's a few smatterings through here about creation, but the rest of the book mostly is about the redemption of God. 
you know. What did creation cost God? Cost him six days. And I'm sure he could do that again right now. But what did redemption cost him? It cost him his son, his only son. That's what the redemption cost him. Um, and I don't know that we can ever put that in perspective as to what is going on. Um, you know, God spoke these things into existence. But his plan of salvation, according to the Hebrew view on it, that what they do is they take a constellation and by number of brightness of the stars in that constellation, it has a Hebrew name. Well, if you take that Hebrew name and translate to what it means, and I only took one because it's the last one, which is Leo, which is the sign of the line, which the tribe of Judah uses, and uh, you hear Jesus referred to as the line of the tribe of Judah. Uh, according to those stars, the brightest stars, it says the king rending... Is the first one the servant fleeing? Is the the serpent fleeing? Is the second one the bowl of wrath upon him? Is the third one, and his carcass devoured? Is the uh, fourth one in the Leo constellation? And we're not going to get into a lot of that, but if you look at those constellations through a set of Hebrew eyes it's very possible that God was telling the story of the redemption of mankind from the time it was created. Possibly. We get a little bit further. She give me the sign. I don't want to rush through this. But verses 1 through 4, we'll probably hit those. Verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is nor, no speech, nor language, whether their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Creation is screaming at us that there is a creator. And it, I mean, you just can't look around. Um... And Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, said, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You have no excuse not recognizing God as creator. I have no excuse. If you go to Romans chapter 10, we'll start about verse 16, I think. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For the sigh saith, Lord, who, shall, who hath believed our report? And that's quoting Isaiah. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. And that's quoted from this psalm, verse 4. Um, does everybody know who Helen Keller was? Okay, she was born deaf and blind and then the guy that taught her or started teaching her later in his life was a man named Philip Brooks and when he gave his first instructions about God to her she said this that she had always known that there was a God but did not know what his name was she's blind and deaf and knew there was a God that existed okay and he told her, but she didn't know what his name was. It's our job to publish the name of the Lord. Okay? But he told her that the most beautiful things could not be seen or touched, but just felt in the heart. Love. She knew there was a God, and she's deaf and blind, born that way. 
Um, that, I think that was in about 1880, somewhere in that neighborhood that that happened. Uh, God has a, he, he's got a place for himself and everybody that lives if they'll just let him in. You know, even, even, even there's a moral code. You go all the way back to uh, Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel. There was a set of instructors. There was a set. We don't read about it. There's nothing in the Bible about it. But there was a set of rules they were to follow. And one didn't follow. So he killed him. Because of that jealousy. Those rules are written in our very being. Verse 4 says, Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. The word line here from the Septuagint means sound. Um, in the Blue Letter Bible it means a cord, a line, a measuring line, a note, or an accord. So there's something that reverberates in all of us. I mean, there's sounds that happen that's not within our hearing spectrum, but you can feel them. You know, the good Lord's speaking to everybody. Creation is screaming that there is a God. And we're going to stop right there because we ain't going to rush through this. We'll stop there. Anybody got any questions or anything before we close out? All right, take you a break. We'll pick up.